middle of them when we sailed to Cy from Cyprus to Gaza to try and get media attention to the siege. I think that was 10 years ago. We never thought it would see 10 years, never in a million years. A siege is a medieval cruelty. You can't get what you need in and you can't get what the people you need out. It, it is, it's unbelievable. So we did it for that reason. And after um, 24 hours at sea, we looked into the distance and there was Gaza rising out into the, the, the mist. And the, the skipper said, land ahoy. And then we noticed there were like spots on the horizon. And what are they? 30,000 Palestinians all making takbir. And I was standing there with the Mediterranean air, Gaza in front of me, and all I could hear was Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And it wasn't a terrifying sound, it was beautiful. It just made you grin. And then everything that could float in Gaza was pushed into the sea. I, you know, surf, little surfboards, and I'm sure I saw a sink at one point. I don't know, everything that could float. And we were pulling children up by kafirs, by the scarves, and it was just incredible, incredible moment of hope. I'm glad to have been a part of that, and I wish, I wish it, it could have changed things. Um, what's your advice to young student activists dealing with events when they're um, protesting for Palestine or campaigning? So, so you're you're about, yeah, I just should be for the campaign. Yeah, um, so what is your advice to people? young people particularly in the prevent, as we know, activists, actually forget about activists, school children feel completely silenced, particularly on issues to the Um be strong together, know your rights, know the laws that are changing so you're aware of the parameters, but but don't give in. Don't don't fold because the parameters are moving. There are great uh, groups out there who specialize in human rights uh, and leftist groups and we need to have a union of like-minded people who care about humanity and sometimes if the pal socks can be very isolated when they should be working with you know uh, you know people from who care about the NHS and people who care you know <laughs> like-minded people working together and just don't give up What's the best way, um, do you think, for them to sort of unify together? Because it is really difficult nowadays. That's a massive question. You're, you're more equipped to answer that because you've been on the ground in that recently. Getting towards the end of our conversation, I was just reminded while you were talking about some of the work we've been doing actually on Nigeria, and particularly Sheikh Zakzaki, who uh, a lot of people know has been in prison for well, actually more than two years now. And I was recently uh, giving a presentation about him at a, a symposium in Spain and talking about the political movement and stuff. I went into the detail, sort of enlightened people about the kind of social justice issues that he was working on. And uh, somebody, a good friend who also knows Sheikh Bezaki very well, asked the question from the audience and he said, you know, it is all really very well that you're trying to explain to people kind of beyond the veil of stereotyping, demonization, etc. But I can ask you honestly, if he was not so outspoken about Palestine, do you think anyone would have cared enough to put him in prison? So in a way, it's a kind of question I want to ask you as well, because, you know, this is a great book. I think it has a, a wide audience there ready to read it. But do you think, you know, if you didn't speak so much about Palestine, that perhaps it would have a wider audience, and if that's the case, would you ever stop kind of highlighting that? That's a really interesting point. Uh, I think there's twin things here, actually. I think the, the, the resistance that I've met is actually, th th there's a hidden resistance to any messaging that's positive about Palestine, don't get me wrong, but that's kind of ongoing. But the resistance as far as, uh, say, BBC interviewers goes is, is this, and I've had this said to me, you're so positive about, Mus where are the bad Muslims in your book? <laughs> Why aren't, why aren't there bad Muslims in there? Have you never met a bad Muslim? Uh, I, I, you know, and I'm like, so hang on, your idea of balance is that in my memoir of positivity about my journey to Islam, you want me to pick out some of the worst Muslims that I may or may not have met in your imagination and put them in there so that you can balance this book with your framing of Muslims. Do you not see how convoluted that is? Can we not have one positive uh, experience? My experience of the Muslim community has been incredibly positive. 
there has also been pain and cheating and lying and there are things on the periphery that human beings do. But that's not my story. My story of coming to Islam has been about light and about care and about inspiration. And that's what I tell in this book. I'd like to invite you to close this. I think um, I will end with the time when I was shopping in Jerusalem. And it was in uh, around 2007. It was my second trip ever to the West Bank. And I had 40 minutes to get all of my shopping done. It was raining, it was the old city, and I was stressed. And I had a piece of paper with a lot of souvenirs written, and on the bottom, Quran in English question mark. Mm. Now, why was there a question mark? Because I didn't think anybody had bothered to translate the Quran into English. I thought it would be really, really hard to find. Because why? It was just some old scripture that a few million Arabs followed. That's how little I knew. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is 2007. So we must never presume that people know more than they do. And so I'm standing in the Iraqi streets, and a young man, Palestinian man, comes over and says, Mahabar! And I think, oh, not today. I don't want Mahabar today. And a voice in my head said to me, don't be rude to people who have only been kind to you. Listen to what this young man has to say. A young man in his late teens fell into step beside me. Marhabar, he said, which meant hi in the local dialect. What can I si assist you with today, madam? Lauren, yes? His smile was beautiful and simple, emitting a bright energy, energy that was infectious. I handed him my shopping list, rather than explaining what I needed. This is great news, Madam Lauren. All of these men here are my uncles. We can go shopping together, yes? Let us begin. Over the next 40 minutes, we went in and out of about 10 different shops, and in every one, I had to have a mint tea with about five sugars in it. Do the maths, 50 sugars in half an hour diabetes and heart attack. At the end, I'm sitting in one of the stalls with Uncle Hamid. The young man was making introductions. This is my Uncle Hamid. His wife has how many? 15 children? No, 18, mashallah. <laughs> we had wandered into a covered area of the market gigantic bedspreads of red, green, even gold, hung behind tabla drums, bangles, and wooden donkeys. Stubbing his cigarette, Uncle Hamid ushered me onto a plastic chair. Chai, he shouted. He can't figure me out. Neither can I. This was my second visit to Palestine in my capacity as a journalist, but I lost my bearings this time around. I'd arrived a year earlier as a curious writer seeking a bit of adventure and a scoop, but I'd never been a war correspondent. I'd begun to feel more inclined towards Archbishop Desmond Tutu's view on the subject of being unbiased. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you've chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse, and you say you're neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. Who could be neutral in Palestine? To be unmoved by the gross injustice was itself an act of barbarity, which made us all a party to the oppression we reported. At the end, I'm crying in the stall, and the man is absolutely bereft. Why are you crying? And he mops my, my tears away. And I go outside with 10, 10 bags of shopping and I ask the young Palestinian man, how much do I owe you? And I get ready to haggle and he looks at the bags and then he says, ah, you don't owe me anything, but there's just one thing. Please don't forget Palestine when you go home. And that's how I got my first ever Quran as a gift from the people of Al-Quds. Thank you, Lauren, for sharing.